Good morning, brothers and sisters, as we return to our study in Numbers 22. Shall we come before our Heavenly Father and ask him for his guidance, for his direction, his wisdom, and his blessing, so that we may more properly understand not only the symbols <clears throat> that are being presented, but also how this example relates to us today. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your complete and total patience with us. We thank you for allowing us <coughs> time to consider these symbols, these examples, and how they relate to us today. Help us now. Direct us so that that which is done may be to your glory. We ask, Father, for your spirit. We ask for your angels. We ask for your blessing upon this study and upon those that are attending and will attend later via internet. Help us now direct us so that that which is done helps us to understand the message that we will need to give. Be with us. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, I find it interesting <clears throat> in the um, little comment before the study, that we do need to consider each of the symbols that are being presented here from Numbers 22 and the four afterward chapters. If we are truly studying according to Miller's rules, we need to understand these figures. We are given names. We are given symbols for different things. We're going to need to, to determine figuratively how all of these things interrelate with us today. So in this study, as we are looking at the children of Israel, they literally existed, but who are they figuratively at this time within this story? How would we place this? <coughs> okay, so you're dealing with uh, Israel in the time in, in the story of Balaam. Correct. That is correct. Yeah, that he's going to curse them, but he ends up blessing them. I mean, well, Israel always represents God's people. Okay. Um, but depending on where we find, how zoomed in we are, uh, would decide what what group of God's people we would be talking about. Okay. So when, so when Jeff makes this application, it, it seems that he's applying it to the church. Okay. But but the church itself is going to fall away it's going to sin and so uh, the ones that are blessed ultimately would refer to those that no longer remain part of the church in that sense okay that structure i mean that's how i would understand it he he's putting it in in the context of 1989 9 11 so this is the reform line of the re repetition of uh the parable of the ten virgins the first and second angels messages Okay. <clears throat> so in this situation, as we are addressing it, you, what you just said is that this can be 
God's people. And then you were placing it as the church. And would we want to place this as the movement? Yeah, so, um, you know, definitely th that's the point that we're trying to say is that we can apply this to the movement as well. Okay. But, but yeah, Jeff's not applying it to the movement in his application. Now, why would that be? Well, it's where, it's where he's at in his understanding of the lines at the time. I mean, in some ways, he's he is, but I mean, he hadn't figured out in, internal and external yet. I mean, there's just many different points that hadn't been understood in 2015 that he later, you know, came to understand. So, yeah, he's not going to be be thinking about that because he, he hasn't sorted out the lines. And, and he's showing different lines, but he's just putting them all one on top of the other, not differentiating. Okay. <clears throat> now, Moses is part of this story. So what would Moses represent? Well, Moses represents, um, I mean, the leadership, but he, he also represents not, not just a regular leadership. It's, it's actually a divine leadership because they're being led by God. So he's a represent, representative of Christ in a sense. Okay. Any other thought on that? He would be a prophet and a judge. And they're under they're under a theocracy at the time. So now why why would we need to pay attention to the fact that this is also a theocracy? Well, it's just the the idea here is that um, church and, and state are combined in a theocracy. Right. That that it's divine. It, it's <coughs> of God leading. Where most examples of the connection of church and state are improper because it's not a theocracy. The state. And the church need to be separate, but in this case, they're they're together. So um, I'm not sure the significance of that. It's just when that she talked about prophet and judge. You have two different aspects of of the government, the church and the state, and and these are combined in Moses. Okay. So he symbolizes the theocracy. Okay. <clears throat> How would we apply Balak, the king of Moab? Hey, I looked up his name, which means waster. That was one of the one of his salient traits, right? And Proverb 89 says, he also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. And I thought, well, who was slothful in his work? Balaam was slothful in his work in the sense that he reneged on his calling. And so he teamed up with Balak and people like him. And then Isaiah 54, 16 also talks about God had created the waster to destroy. I better look up the verse because I don't know by heart. Behold, I've created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. Okay, you just presented very good information, but you have not answered the question. 
who could he represent? Okay. Okay. Well, definitely people with that trait, those traits. Destructive, <laughs> wasting. Okay, so what you have Balak, the king of Moab. Who would Balak represent? Specifically, I'm not sure at this time. Well, it would be an enemy of Israel. And the yeah, enemy. We know that. So, I mean, you have some choices. You have the papacy, you have the United Nations, the globalists. Um, You, you could even have uh, it represent the Protestants. Okay. Yeah, it's just that there's so many, it's hard to pinpoint just one. And it depends which line you're looking on again. No, that's the thing. Okay. And even if, if, I mean, if you're doing internal, internal within this movement, it would represent, uh, you know, because with the story of Balak and Balaam, I mean, we definitely have the idea of the Protestant interpretation of, of Scripture. So um, the abandonment of Miller's rules, all those types of things. So there's different ways that I've tried to look at this whole story. Um, and it's just, it's kind of multi-layered. I agree it's multi-layered. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our situation right now is that as we're going through this, we're going to have to make application on each of these symbols. Do this. Okay, my apology. Okay, now, as we look at these symbols, we're going to be making application as to how this applies. We may well have a way of looking at this that applies to the church, but I think we're also going to have to be very aware that this is a, an example that has direct implication and applying directly to the movement right now. So if we are looking at this as we just did with Balak, <clears throat> if Balak, the king of Moab, is the enemy of God's people, and with that possibly being the papacy or the Protestants, then the Moabites would also wind up being the same. Would you have any, any disagreement with what I'm saying here? Yeah, they would, they would have to align okay now if that's the case who do the midianites represent Well, these would be Islam. These would be, I mean, they come from, their Arabs. Okay. They're, so, they're, but they're related. So I, I don't know how, do you, how you would do that. Because they're related to Israel. But they occupy the area that is the Arabian Desert, part of the, the northern part, northwestern part 
of the Arabian Desert. Okay. So I'm not really sure. And and Midianites is used sometimes just to refer to different groups of people, even though it, technically it should be referring to um, those that are descended from Keturah, right? Okay. So, I mean, we, we looked into them quite a bit. So, and, and remember, they're also referred to as Ish Ishmaelites in the story of Joseph. So the Midianites and the Ishmaelites are become inter interchangeable, even though technically the Midianites are not Ishmaelites. So that's Genesis 37, 28. Okay, so. They're first spoken of, of as merchants. Genesis 37, 28. Yeah. So if you go in that section there, it, it shows they're Ishmaelites, the merchants, their Midianites. So, so it's hard to say, but you know what they particularly re represent here. Okay, so I'm I'm going to propose what would uh, what some people would say as being a heretical thought. What if the Midianites? represent the corporate church well you would have to explain how that would be what is one of the things that the church does that is very different say from your baptists methodists or many other protestant denominations I don't know. Pull porters. Oh. So other churches don't have coal porters, I guess, eh? No. Does the church still have coal porters? The Adventist church? Yeah. I believe so. Sure. I've met many. Well, not many, but that's how my family came into this church was well, well, through a coal porter. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I'm just wondering <laughs> if have them because I know they were disbanded in Canada. They still have them here. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, uh, maybe they had some other kind of form of doing it, but uh, but definitely the organization that they used in Canada for the coal coal porters disappeared and it was shut down. When was that? Because the last time I met any was, I guess, in 2008. It was 2008. Yeah, it would have been recently. But what is the function of a coal porter? Well, they sell books. Oh, they're merchants. Yeah, they're merchants. Would that not line up with the Midianites? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's a pretty tenuous kind of uh, connection. Well, I look at the Moabites because they are, of course, descendant from Lot. The Midianites, of course, are descendant from Abraham. Yeah. So there's a very direct relationship between the children of Israel and the Midianites. There's a not so direct, but still a relationship between the Moabites and the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> we have Balaam. The conversation has been that Balaam represents the United States. Right? Yep. Yeah. That's what Jeff says. And the ass represents, right? Islam. Yep. 
Would, would do we still agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and, and it could represent, of course, it might represent the Democrats if we're making some other application. But in the bigger line of what Jeff has done, it's definitely I Islam. But the other thing that we also have here is it could be representing the prophecies regarding Islam. So it could be representing not Islam directly, but predictions or understandings regarding Islam. Um, but that's just an idea. Okay. As we're going to get into this further, we have walls. I should have put vineyards as well. The point we were making yesterday is that the walls. <clears throat> represent <clears throat> marriage and the Sabbath. The vineyards doctrines. What would the narrow place represent? How would we approach this? You could remove that extra R in doctrines there. Um, thanks. Could the narrow place be the narrow way? Can it go from one extreme to the other? Okay. Well, I mean, to me, it, it represents... Um, uh, because you have two walls, I mean, it's a doubling, right? So you have the two walls in the, in the, with the vineyards. Now, the narrow place, I, I'm not sure how, if that's connected to the two walls of the vineyards or not, whether there's the two walls and then they become narrow, or whether that's just um, a narrow place in some other way. You have the, the vision that El Might has where you start off with wagons and then they move onwards and these are wagons and so forth. Like things just get narrow and narrower. Right. So, they, so there's that maybe you could tie that in just as uh, where we are some point in the journey where we're kind of constrained, more trusting in God. Mm -hmm. and that And that's what Heidi's kind of suggesting there. You don't go into either ditch, you just keep on the narrow. Yeah. You know, question is Balaam in this place. Um, so there, there's still lots of, you know, we have to sort out here. All we're doing right now is getting a basic understanding. <clears throat> we're going to have a lot we're going to have to look at as we consider and continue through these sections. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I found very intriguing, as I have read through this in the story and example of Balaam, I don't think that we can properly examine chapters 22, 23, and 24 without including chapter 25. Now, when Elder Jeff was putting together his lines, he put it up as numbers 22 to 24. 
we have in 23 and 24 Balaam's oracles. Mm -hmm. But we also see what the outcome is of Balaam's recommendations to Balak within chapter 25. Mm-hmm. Now I'm I'm putting at the bottom of this list Zimri, the son of Salu, of the tribe of the Simeonites, Cosby, the daughter of Zer, of the tribe of the Midianites. What occurred at Peor in the worship of Baal was a dark stain upon the history of the children of Israel. We're going to have to look at that figure as it may apply to us today. But as we study this, according to Miller's rules, we will have to look at these symbols, apply the symbols. I mean, if if we're going to have to do this in, in several different levels, fine. But the symbols are going to have to make sense and do no violence to the verse and to our understanding of what's going on. <clears throat> so as I was considering this, it to me became very important that we look at what each of these symbols are meaning for us and how they would then be applied within the different lines that we're going to address. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, we go back to this. Here's where we were leaving this last week, or the yesterday. Numbers 22, 22, to recap. And God's anger was kindled because he, Balaam, went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against Balaam. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. If Balaam is representationally the United States, the two servants for the United States would be Protestantism and Republicanism. And I think we addressed that yesterday. 22, 23, and the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. Balaam strikes at the ass. Now, <clears throat> we were just addressing whether the ass was Islam or prophecies regarding Islam. Are we going to look at this specifically or are we going to look at it as this example more generally what what are your thoughts because when i'm looking at this specifically as islam it begins to make sense when i'm looking at it as prophecies regarding islam i would need some help to understand this
Okay, so so we got Balaamite riding an ass. And right. So that means United States is somehow tied up with Islam. Okay. Right? And prophecies regarding Islam. We, we wouldn't say that the United States is controlling Islam because obviously Islam, I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe we could. Uh, maybe that could refer to uh, the fact that the United States has kept these Islamic states under their control. And then these sort of get out of their control at certain points of history. Maybe that would be <clears throat> too. Um, you know, I mean, can, what, what do the Islamic states represent as far as um, if Balaam is riding them? What would that imply? Great oil wealth, and they were all paying it. <clears throat> it was being uh, bought by U.S. U.S. dollars, and now some of them are dumping dollars. The U.S. is incensed about that. Well, Balaam is reliant upon the ass <clears throat> so that could be the the, the oil could be okay. but he's also deciding as he's reliant upon the ass he doesn't get off the ass Mm -hmm. But when the ass turns out of the way, he begins to strike the ass. Right. So this could be the United States giving a strike against Islam. Would that be in what history? Would you look at the history from, you know, 19... 79 to 90, 1989. How did they strike at Islam at that point? Well, I mean, we have Russia, the Soviet Union, and this war in Afghanistan. Now, I mean, you could say the United States is supporting Afghanistan, but... Um, the United what, States did support them. Right, yeah. That's the problem. Well, yeah, except that um we we see that that whole history leads into what happened um in regard to 1989 and also 1991 and uh kuwait and all these different events so but you could even go back further right so um i don't know what event you'd have to pick the event that would be uh, turning out of the way into the field. The, the problem is there's just so many events. How do you decide what the most significant event is? Or do you just take that whole history together as a unit? Because it, it's a very complex history, too. It's not just really simple. Well... The simplest one, <clears throat> as we are, I think, as we are agreed, is going to be 9 11, but that's more down the road, not in this part. Right. So, I mean, you have 1993. <clears throat> I mean, so, I mean, what you would have to say is, is if United States is dependent on oil, I mean, you know, where does that really begin? It's turning the side out of the way and going into a field by, by Islam, by these Islamic countries that control the oil. You know, I... 
because it, it, again, it's a complex history. I mean, usually what we want is kind of some kind of visible event that's quite clear. Like nine eleven is a very visible event, but you know, it 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 marks a whole history of things that occurred. Right? It just didn't pop out of nowhere. We had all that terrorism. And, of course, we have 1993, February 26th. So you had the suggestion that maybe that was the, the ass turning aside out of the way. Right. And, and that would be a strike on the United States. So if that was a strike on the United States, that would not fit. Well, well, would. well, that's the question, because we know then that, that uh, Balaam responds to this. So it's, it's um, you know, you have, you have the ass acting in a way that, and this is because the United States is going in a wrong direction, going against God. And, and, and the question is, when does that begin? Is is that in connection with its alliance with the papacy under Reagan? Right. I mean, that's one of the ways that we look at it, uh, because this is going to lead to the threefold union. The United States, I mean, I mean, it's been progressive for a long period of time, but that's something that's quite clear when the United States and the papacy combined to overthrow the Soviet Union. Yes, you had the application that Jeff made concerning the long, the long drawn out war. Mm -hmm. You had the Eastern Roman Empire fighting against, I think it was like the Parthenage, the Parthian Empire, and then they finally defeated them. Rome, Rome was uh, victorious, and then you had Islam coming up. At that their time after that war, and you parallel that then to after 1989, you had the King of the North, the North, coming against the King of the South, and then once that victory was done, you have Islam rising up again. Okay. How else can, with, with what you just said, Stephen, would this support or remove the idea of 1993 being a turning out of the way? Well, Jeff, he had connected it to the uh, early writings okay. where you have the four winds about to be let loose. Right. And then uh, you have Christ saying, my blood, my blood. And then there, there is a restraint of Islam. So I, I would think 9-11 would apply more to that than 1993. Okay. Okay. And, and because Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way? So the restraint on Islam? Yes. See, I'm, I'm not trying to disagree with Elder Jeff, but he was also very clear later that the point where Balaam and his foot is crushed against the wall <clears throat> was an economic event. Right, which, which occurred after 9-11. Well, 9-11 led to an economic yeah. 
event occurring because it led to a shutdown of the United States. There was no air travel. There was for months afterward, it affected tourism, it affected a lot of things. So economically, it had a huge impact. So I was just, what, what I was attempting to see applied is what we could look at as the turning out of the way. Now, Numbers 22, 24, but the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. <clears throat> so, the smiting of the ass the second time. The attack upon Islam the second time. Became noted and prevalent within this verse. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. How should we apply this? How do we look at this narrow place? Well, at the, I mean, Jeff is going to connect this to the Sunday law, this because the ass will speak and, um, so I'm not going to disagree with connecting it to the Sunday law, but which Sunday law? Well, this would be the states. Would you repeat that, please? Because you kind of broke up. I think you got cut off. Wonderful. Gotta love it when this happens by the internet. Could be worse. No, when I'm looking at the narrow way, I was I had I think I chatted the verses in Proverbs 4. And that's mainly talking about a personal walk with God. Of course, it could stand for a national walk with God or righteousness anyway. But Proverbs 427 is kind of neat because it says, turn not to the right hand, nor to the left, remove thy foot from evil. I was interested in, in it saying right or left. So avoid taking sides with either the Democrats, Republicans, Trumpites, whoever. Yeah, okay, I, I missed some of that. But I mean, I was saying that it's the Sunday law in the United States. Um, but Angela is saying that the left and the right is referring to <laughs> political spectrum. We were addressing. Well, that's, yeah, you could take it that way for sure. But, you know, like I, I think I posted Proverbs 4, 18 and 25 through, through 27. And I was think, thinking, well, that's mainly a, your personal walk with God. But if it's a national walk with God, couldn't you be supposed to be focusing on your foundations? Republicanism and Protestantism in the U.S. case. Yeah. Which they just you know, discarded. Yeah. And, and right and left, if we remember, right refers to the south and left to the north. 
Right. Okay, so. Okay, so the question I had asked when you were cut off, Theodore, mm -hmm. when the, the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place, I was asking the question as to what the thoughts were regarding the narrow place. You had begun to respond, but your response was very quickly cut off. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we, you, uh, the question that I responded to was about which Sunday law. Because okay. I said it would be the Sunday law, and you asked which, and I said the Sunday law in the United States. Okay. So I just think that there, there's a lot of this that we have to be clear with because there are so many that, that are vocal about the Sunday law, but never being direct about which Sunday law. Yeah. And I mean, because we know there's the Sunday law in the United States. This leads to the Sunday laws that occurs in the world. So, you know, the other nations follow. And then we know that after the close of probation, during the sixth plague at least, uh, we have the time of Jacob's trouble, which contains the death decree attached to the Sunday law. So, so Sunday law is progressive. Sunday law is progressive, but there's at least three steps. Yeah, and, and the first one in the United States is a closed pr probation for Seventh-day Adventists. Right. Uh, in the United States, and of course that will follow in other countries as well, because if you can't pass that Sunday law, you're not going to pass any other Sunday law that comes along. You already will have made your choice. Right. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. <clears throat> what are we reading here? What are we seeing? How do we apply the symbols that we've been addressing in this verse? I mean, so you have this this ass falling down under Balaam, right. correct? The United States, so to speak, whatever that means. Um, and this causes anger towards the ass, and he's going to smite it with his staff, um, the makhala. Um, so. And what would that staff symbolize? I mean, the falling down. What is? What would we say the falling down symbolizes? I mean, it, well, it's a loss of support in some way. In a great way. Yeah. But I'm just not sure which particular, how that, how that manifests itself. Okay. <clears throat> how would an ass fall down? Trip on something? Well, they would, they, they would sort of fall. Wouldn't they fall sort of like kneel down oh, and then saying. under weight, they would kneel down? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that's what a horse would do. They definitely don't just tip over sideways. <laughs> that's usually. So if it's kneeling down, what do we normally approach kneeling with? How do we see that? I mean, it can be done with worship. 
um, or just basically submission? I would think it would be submission. Now, of course, this is the angel of the Lord that, uh, you know, Moss sees, which Balaam does not. But I'm I'm saying that rather than being subservient to its writer, it is subservient then to what it sees. I would say so. Yeah. It might be able to see things that the writer can't see, actually. The rider is forcefully using the ass. Agreed. <clears throat> now, if the if the ass falls down and does so by kneeling, would Balaam not then have pitched forward? Yes. So here's the ass. Its rider is now being pitched forward and very possibly being pitched off. Mm -hmm. So question in the chat. <clears throat> Could the falling down also harken back to Genesis 49, 14? Would you care to explain your point? Just the question says, uh, okay, is a car is a strong ass? crouching down between two burdens. But 15 is interesting too, because it says he saw that rest was good. When I see, see rest, I think Sabbath. So then we could think of the Sunday law opposing Sabbath. And the land that it was pleasant, the pleasant land, Israel, the US, and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. Sounds like slavery, servant unto tribute. I guess yeah. I'm, I'm, if you're paying homage to the papacy by accepting the Sunday law, you're paying tribute to the papacy. Go ahead with your comment, Theodore. Okay, well, so one other thing then, is as far as the symbol of the ass, it does symbolize Issachar as well. Whatever it <laughs> means. But we're not applying Issachar as the ass in this situation. No, but it may have something to do with the prophecy of Islam. How? Uh, by the span of time that we get from the tribe of Issachar. Right, so going back to how we were applying these uh, number of days. Okay, would you care to explain that a little further? Well, um, you know, one example is if I take the number of, of the tribe of Issachar, 54,400, and I take it as days, if I go from July 18th, 1870, and we remember what July 18th, 1870 is, right? Refresh me, please. Papal infallibility? Thank you. Okay. And that's going to bring us to June 27th, 2019. It's going to bring us into that history of um, the rebellion of Baal Peor uh, that we see with Parminder. Now, it's going to be, of course, uh, a couple of months later, though 
it is still in that history where they are, because in June of 2019, um, I was at a camp meeting in Alberta and Tess was saying there's not going to be a Sunday law. And so that history there um, is going to lead to what we see happening with that full fledged rebellion. So Issachar then can symbolize a prophetic symbol of the ass that is a period of time. It doesn't mean the other ones don't apply, but one of the things that it seems to be here, at least when we look internally in the movement, that, I mean, we have the symbol of July 18, though it's 1870, but we're tying it to um, the rebellion or the rejection of July 18 as a prophecy by part of the movement or Minder's faction. What happened in 1870 again? I didn't hear you. July 18th, 1870 was um, during the first Vatican Council. Or, okay. Or, what do they call that? But, um, right. This is this is when Pio Nono, Pius the Ninth, yeah, gave his proclamation, basically establishing the Catholic dogma of papal infallibility yeah they, they have another term a latin term for it <clears throat> when he speaks what, ex yeah ex cathedral yeah. yeah okay so i mean he has infallibility in a very specific sense but still it's interesting it's july 18th 1870 the two symbols of july 18th um and that when we use Issachar, it connects us to that history of Parminder's rebellion that was happening from June, July, August, um, 2019. Uh, it, you're right, it is kind of interesting because if you write this out in the European fashion, your date would be written 187-18. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. So. Yeah, and as Iran notes, uh, Parminder and Tess were basically claiming infallibility over scripture. Well, how else could you establish your idolatry mm -hmm. until you have established that you are infallible over God himself? Mm -hmm. Why is it important that we note that Balaam's anger was kindled? Well, it shows the action of the United States. The action of the United States against whom? Well, against Islam. Okay. <clears throat> Would this not apply to 9-11? Well, well, yeah. Now, we could also look at, um, I mean, there's earlier stuff prior to 9-11 where the United States is fighting against Islamic nations. I mean, the war with Iraq. But wasn't the war with Iraq more against say Saddam Hussein more or Muammar Gaddafi before in instead of just about Islam in general yeah yeah it but, but it's about containing gaining control of oil I mean you know with Kuwait and all that
Well, as a people, were or was the United States angry with Islam in say from 93 to 2000 okay uh, not to answer that question but I'm asking another question why did Islam attack the United States in both 1993 and 2001. What was the reason they had? They viewed the United States as the great Satan. Okay, so that's, you know, so they saw the United States as evil. Um, was that the only reason? Was it merely a um, moral attack? Were they be being led by the United States? He's riding them. Well, they were a supporter of Israel. Okay, so there's this issue with Israel. I would call it, he, I thought they said it was a holy war. Right. So there's lots of different things going on at the same time, <clears throat> lots of different motivations and reasons. Um, but in order to sort of simplify it, we would look at it. the United States has the control of the Islamic nations in that it controls the oil. Or at least it's dependent upon that oil and it has some sort of exercise of control over oil. Now, Many, many people, when, when it came to this, uh, the Iraq war, um, and, and also the war that followed after 2001, I mean, all the different things that went on, the war with Kuwait, the war with Iraq, I mean, many people in their criticism of that war was that it was about oil, um, and, and especially the war with Iraq was unnecessary. And of course, we have, you know, back in 73, dealing with, uh, you know, what was happening with the oil. I don't remember all the details. I was alive then, but. I lived through it, so yeah. Yeah. Because you had the oil embargoes, you had the, the yeah. formation of OPEC. Mm -hmm. And OPEC began to set the prices that were going to be paid for the foreign oil. Yeah. <clears throat> At that point, the American people were getting very frustrated because they were frustrated at OPEC because of the, the impact that came upon the American economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I, I mean, I keep pointing out the obvious. It's very complex. But the reasonings that are given and, and the different types of conflicts that were occurring. I mean, they would have a public reason. That is, there was reasonings or rationalizations of why they're doing something. But we don't really know what's all behind it. Right. That, that's part of the problem with this history is in some ways it's, it's rather contradictory. I mean, you have America supplying um, Islamic countries with weapons that are eventually going to be used on Americans. Um, and, and all these little, <coughs> you know, headlines that occur, the headlines that occur, but they, it doesn't really follow. Like, it doesn't seem like there was a logical understanding of what was happening. Or was there an understanding of what was happening? but just that the reasons given for their actions were not the true reasons, you know, on, on both sides or all sides, I guess, maybe. So, so I think we have to kind of simplify it when we deal with Balaam being dependent upon the ass. I mean, he's dependent upon oil. 
And because of that, these events are going to arise, the going out of the turning out of the way into the field, the crushing of the foot, and then finally uh, the falling down of the ass and the ass speaking. What, whatever that particularly means. But the United States is still, in a sense, in control of this ass and that it's riding it. But these events mark some kind of resistance or turning out of the way or, or strikes or whatever um, against the United States. And even that, that symbol of the, nor the left and the right, or the north and the south, I mean, those are the two enemies, right? That's going to be the papacy on the one hand, and, um, and then you have, well, it depends. I mean, the papacy is the king of the north. And then you have the king of the south, which is... Um, uh, the globalists, right? So you got, you know, Babylon on the north, Egypt on the south. Um, so, you, so you have different, different ways in which this could be understood, different lines. These symbols, they all seem to have more than one meaning. That's the way it would look, yes. And now the, the question is, can we combine them all? Can they all make sense? Isn't that the purpose of this study right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I don't think it's really, you know, do we just choose, I mean, we can use all the symbols of the ass. Can we not? That it's Issachar, that it's Islam. See, the, the reason I'm having an issue with applying Issachar yeah. isn't Issachar part of God's people. Yes, but when we're applying Issachar here, we're applying it specifically to what's happening within the movement. When okay, so, so in other words, in other words, what you're saying is that you're going to have one line that is going to be strictly external and one line that is going to be internal. Yeah. And the internal one is reflected by the prophecies regarding Islam, which are external prophecies that are prophesied within our movement that don't occur typify what's going to happen on on a bigger scale okay i think that that thought is logical um so another thing um when we look at um this uh can, can i bring up my screen you just, uh, I'm going to bring that share. There you are. Okay. Oops. Okay. So here I have um, a diagram at the top. It's going to show September 11th, 1814. And it's going to show uh, a span of time. Um, there's a few different spans of time at the top, but just kind of ignore those for now. Um, and then you're going to see on the bottom there of that top line, the Issachar from Numbers 1, the 54,400 days representing the 54,400 of the tribe of Issachar, right? right. And I have this span of time. Now, over here, I have September 11th, 1814. That's the Battle of Plattsburgh going to July 18th, 1870. And I have that as 22,100 days. Now, sometimes some of these diagrams that I've drawn are sort of um, uh, 
working uh, papers, and so I, I sometimes have to go back and check them. But if I go to September 11th and I count uh, 22100, that's going to bring me to a different date. So that must be wrong. So um, I'm trying to figure out what I was doing there. Uh, that brings me to some other date. Anyway, so that doesn't work. What other date does it bring you to? Um, just let me try this again. Well, so if I go to... Okay. <clears throat> So I think there's, yeah. Well, that was from another one. So I have to go, just hang on a sec. Sure. Uh, because that brings me to 1875, March 15th, which doesn't make any sense. So I got to go July. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, so that's okay, so I, okay, so that doesn't work out. We'll just ignore that for now. <laughs> um, I'm not sure why I have this here, so I must have that, that correction you could work on. I think it's it is interesting that from September eleventh, eighteen fourteen from the Battle of Lake Champlain. Yeah. You come up with 74,600 days, which is the number of Judah from Numbers 1, that brings you to December 10th of 2018. Yeah. Now, you've also got from July 18th, 1870, <clears throat> from Pio Nono's pronouncement, you have 54,400 days to June 27th of 2019. Yep. Now, what's the significance here of the 200 days from December 10th of 2018 to June 27th of 2019? I don't know. Um... I think that's referring to First Chronicles twelve thirty two. Explain, please. Okay, hey, I'll have to look it up. Yeah, and see, this needs to be reworked. So this was something where I was editing another one. See, here was the original twenty two thousand four hundred days. It doesn't even make sense. I don't know what's going on here. My fingers, <laughs> my fingers are really arthritic and it's hard to turn pages, but it says, and of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200 and all their brethren were at their commandment. So possibly that's where you got the 200? I just find the time span to be interesting. Yeah. Or is it an actual amount of days? Because you got a good parallel there. Yeah, I know, but anyway. I'm going to have to work on that a bit more. Here, you can go back to your your screen. But anyway, the point is, uh, what I'm seeing is there's something internal within the movement, and and I hadn't worked, I hadn't finished all of that. So I have some that are work in progress. Some of these diagrams. Um, there's going to be quite a bit to address there. Now, yeah, we've we've got six minutes remaining in today's study. The diagrams that you just brought up have some interest. Yeah, but there, there's some mistakes on them because they're work in progress. So those are some of the things I need to finish off. Um, so just another thing dealing with uh, Numbers 22 because, um, I mean, we 
we didn't really did we finish numbers 22 did we go through it all we're, we're not complete in numbers 22 yeah but yeah we okay so we hadn't even read through it all yet no today. we have not okay yeah because there are some things later um but you know numbers 22 33 where it talks about the ass saw me and turned from me these three times where he talks about this unless she had turned from me surely now also i had slain thee and saved her alive so this is the angel of the lord speaking to balaam um so you know what the ass saw the angel of the lord and why is the angel of the lord saying it this way it turned from me these three times unless she had turned from me surely now also i had slain thee and saved her alive so there's there's something else about this turning out of the way in the sense that um it has preserved the united states that this is a lengthening of lengthening of prob probationary time for the u.s all right <clears throat> and, and and so the question is uh has has what has happened with islam um affected the united states in a positive way as far as its relationship with god even though it's still you know not following god but as far as the people are concerned Well, that sort of connects with that. I think so. Okay, Stephen? Yeah, it's just what you're saying there seems to connect with early writings. I think it's page 38. Mm -hmm. Four winds are about to, to be let loose. But there, mm -hmm. There's a delay. Right. And so so this delay of of this these judgments are... are are so that the people of God can be sealed on their foreheads, right? Yes. Okay. So in our lines, we have these, these typical lines that are talking about what's going to happen. They're warnings. What has happened to this movement is a warning to Seventh-day Adventists, and it's going to lead to a, a presentation of a warning to Seventh-day Adventists and to the world. That is, what God is doing right now in our studies, in this movement, and all that has happened, is that God is, is bringing us through an experience, a three-step testing prophetic message, uh, to develop and demonstrate two classes of worshipers. And that is something that is typical of what's going to happen on a larger scale. Would, would people agree with that? Because the typical nature of our line is something that we in the movement really never address other than in these studies uh, and why is that why are we not wanting to understand that our line is typical dwight anybody well <clears throat> i think that the point has been being avoided we're going to have to as, as we consider this through the day, we're going to have to consider the question that you just asked, and we're going to have to take this up in the morning. Why does no one wish to consider this as being a typical situation, a typical line? Mm -hmm. And, and this goes <coughs> to Stephen's study, where you know we're addressing, of course, things like the siege, beginning in 2019. 
right? 2019, I'd already recognized that. And that symbol is the 10th day of the 10th month, October 10th. And, and if you go back to my studies about October 10th and October 11th, that's actually going to be the discovery of the 777 chiasm, right? So there's, there's a whole bunch of things that are discovered there. Uh, um, well, not directly the seven, but things that lead to it. So there's a whole understanding that happens there. And then we have the Trump's uh, home being under siege on the eighth day of the eighth month, August 8th, which we have a symbol of 888 or 88, I mean. And, and we know that we attached 1776 in Stephen's study and, and 1776 is 888 times two. But also that date was the 10th day of the fifth month on the biblical calendar, which is the date of construction of the temple. So in all of these things, we would have to see these as typical. We, we definitely wouldn't see them as actual. So define typical. So a type illustrates something that's going to happen prophetically in the future. And in this case, what we're experiencing is we're experiencing Millerite history from the past. So as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, reflects back up on the past, and then that history shines light forward on our on our on our feet, right? So as this movement moves forward, if we're going to understand what's happening in the future, we need to understand what we're fulfilling now prophetically, that it's it's symbolic. And that it's reflecting back on past events to give light to them, to make, help us understand them so that we can understand what's coming. But what I see is that people are trying to place us in a history that is external, that hasn't happened yet. And, and ignoring the fact that we haven't had midnight or the midnight cry on the line of the Levites. That is, we haven't experienced yet those events. We've experienced them in type, but they're not really related to Sunday in any direct way in the Sabbath. Okay. Right. So that's what I mean by a typical line. And so to look for the Sunday law to just jump in a sense out of nowhere without us having done our, our job doesn't make any sense to me. And, but also it ignores everything that we learned about the lines. And, and, that, and I think that's why here, as we start to sort through this story, to understand what Jeff was saying about the story of Balaam and what he said about Islam, we then need to figure out where these have applied in our lines. And, and, and in our lines, they don't actually have to be events that occur with Islam. They just need to be predictions about Islam. And that's why I'm saying that this, these are prophecies about Islam they don't have to be fulfilled in a typical line. They just have to be understood what they mean symbolically. So July 18th is supposed to be attack on Nashville by Islam. It didn't occur. So the, the, the human reaction is we were wrong. So let's just get rid of all that. But if we understand it was typical in, in the sense of its prediction, then we don't have to have the event fall that we predicted on that date. We just need to understand the structure and our experience and how our experience relates to what's going to happen in the future. Is that clear? That's better. <clears throat> okay, now are there any other comments or questions since we have reached the end of our time today? <clears throat> All right, in the morning, we are going to be returning to this portion of Judges 22. I recommend to each that we read this chapter again, along with, or along with Numbers 23, 24, and 25, to be more prepared for what we're going to be addressing this week. 
it may also be an idea to look some of this up in the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, read the section in Patriarchs and Prophets dealing with that. So, all right, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, You are indeed patient. Your loving kindness endureth forever. You are showing us that you are willing for us to learn so that we may make our informed choice as to whose banner we are going to stand underneath. Be with us now. Guide us through this day. Be with us in the events of today and that which we, you would have done. Help us now, Father, so that we may indeed be more dependent upon you for all that is to be done. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the study for the conversation, and for all that you are doing. Be with us now. Direct us as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.